And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. One part of the double-headed monster that is the, that is Big and Funky Productions, and a, and a bit of a and a bit of and someone who's venturing into the wild and wacky world of the twenty-sided dice, the one and only Amber. She's not a sergeant. Schultz. How are we doing hello, tonight? Hello. Yeah, I had I had to get I had to get one bad jo I had to get one bad joke in, out of my system, and with a name like Schultz, I immediately thought of. Wait, sar like you know, Sergeant Schultz? Honestly, I know nothing and I see nothing. <laughs> so, uh, before we before we get into the the weird wor the weird world of twenty sided dice and twenty sided dice accessories, um, I'd like to kind of go into the origin story of how Big and Funky Productions got off the ground. Okay. So Big and Funky was started by um, tag team pro wrestling tag team partners um, Luke Walker and Vinny Vineyard, mm -hmm. and both of them are from up north. One's from Baltimore, one's from Chicago, and they both migrated down south. And um, they started with doing comedy skits and doing different promos for their wrestling. Mm -hmm. And from there, it moved into a paranormal investigation. And we actually have a paranormal show called Wrestling with Ghosts. Mm -hmm. It's still on. We're, in our, we're going into our fourth season. Mm -hmm. And um, in 2020, when um, the pandemic hit, everything in the movie industry just kind of shut down. And so we looked at that as like, okay, this is, this is our chance. Let's, they, they had always wanted to do a movie, so they they filmed a movie. Mm -hmm. And the first movie is called The Hike, and it's actually on Amazon Prime, and it has won many awards. Mm -hmm. And from there, it was our springboard into our second movie, which just premiered, which is WJ, WJHCAM. Mm -hmm. And um, we're getting ready to actually uh, film our third movie in the spring. Yep. Uh uh, when I've, well, I well I have well I well most of my acting experiences is, is with stage. I've delved a, I've delved a bit when it comes to, um, f when it comes to film, mostly mm -hmm. mostly just be, mostly just being a glorified stunt guy for an extended weekend. But it but hey, it counts. <laughs> right. Um. There's all, I think everybody has that one story of of um the best laid plans going awry. When it comes yeah. when it comes to when it comes to things work things trying to work on set and it and it doesn't, um, is there are there any stand are there any standout stories of that of that that you can think of? Well, with the, with the first movie, the hike, um, it was all done outdoors in the Smoky Mountain National Park, mm -hmm. and um, they all all of the all of the actors were pro wrestlers, so they all did their own stuff. Well, the problem was is the terrain was so um uneven mm -hmm. that our lead actor that was was Vinny he would fall over every 10 seconds like he would trip on a root they'd be in the middle of doing a gimmick and we they had it took several takes to get this one fight scene done <laughs> because he would continuously just like he would trip and fall over and it was not part of the choreography and so that was a big contender was trying to just kind of adjust our the stunt to the terrain of the set of the movie. Mm -hmm. And when it came, when it came to when it came when it came to um, set when it came to set setting up outdoors, how how um how long were you, how long for each day would you say that you were shooting? Because I've seen I've I've certainly seen my fair share of stories of the whole lo the whole long take issue. <laughs> yes. So. It was usually a two two to three hour hour hike into where they were shooting, mm -hmm. and then they would shoot all day and then hike and carry all the gear two to three hours back down the hill. Um, in the in the early scenes, um, our lead actor Vinny was kind of he wasn't chubby, but he was not fit. And by the end of the movie, from all of the hiking, his form changed. 
it was kind of remarkable. I guess that's that's one way to do it, and there's cer there's certainly worse ways to go about it. You could have had the RoboCop problem, right? Exactly. <laughs> you know where where great great idea to have an, to have a guy in an eighty to have a skinny guy in an eighty pound suit try and try and act like a mime in the hot Texas sun. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and the f the fact that the fact that they wanted him that they wanted him to train in in these fluid mime emotions is something that will always be funny to me. Yes, <laughs> I just wanted to be a fly on the wall, like without all of the music and all the lights and all the craziness. Can you just imagine a guy standing there in that suit doing these mime things with no sound, nothing? To me, that's humorous just to think about. Oh, yeah, and more moreover, the whole thing of I don't want I don't want to gloss over the fact that they brought in. Peter Weller was not a big guy because they didn't want to do the Schwarzenegger route. And they were having the RoboCop suit was a combination of of um of rubber and and um fiberglass. And it weighed about eighty pounds. Could you imagine? I mean that's so hot and heavy and, and yeah, oh my gosh. Even though the even though the film was in Detroit, they because this was around the time when Dallas was on that futurism kick in the '80s. That's where they were mm -hmm. filming. And yeah. I get the f maybe it's just me, maybe it's just me, but fil but filming in a in a heavy suit with slow movements in the middle of in the middle of a Texas summer should probably be listed as a war crime. <laughs> yes, that, I, I mean that's I, like <laughs> that's too much. And when it comes to those, when it comes to those long stretches of hiking, um, I might be a bit biased because of the fact that I, I've done my fair share of hiking, and one of the things they beat into your head is properly managing the weight. Yes. Because if you got say thirty pounds on your on your back, it's a, it's not going to be pleasant, but it's going to be easier than having th than having thirty pounds on your on your side or carrying a heavy kayak or something like that. Exactly. Yeah, and that was the problem with the first movie is none of, none of them were outdoorsy people at all, and so the, they were we were ear, if not properly packing. There was just a lot going on. So this next movie that we're getting ready to film, which is Camp Smokey, is also going to be outdoors, and we're we're packing in a whole different direction. The so thirty pounds is going to be evenly distributed versus you know just being carried on the side or whatever. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's the reason why even even when I go to conventions, when I ha when I I always I always make sure to have my backpack evenly distributed when it comes to my equipment. Mm -hmm. Granted, my equipment is significantly lighter than a, than a full on um, film production, but you're in that. But when you're in that thing for long stretches of time, you make all the you make all the concessions you can make. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yes. Exactly. I hope. I would. I won't deny that there's a part of me that would love to be a, been a fly on the wall, seeing a bunch of non-outdoorsy folk try and try and set up a fire. <laughs> it, it was rather entertaining. So, um, they there was a lot of fun. There was one. There's one scene that was actually done inside of a cave, and there was bat bat shit everywhere. There was um, they were slipping and falling on the rocks inside the cave. It was it was just a lot. Because you know the first movie was extreme; it was very low budget, mm -hmm. so it was you know we didn't have like a massive film crew, we didn't have like a bunch of grips and sound people. It was just them doing yeah. the, doing the stuff. So it was it was a lot. And so whenever we got into our second movie, which um, we grew the crew um, by a few people, and we had brought in more actors and actresses, and it made it a little bit easier to manage than the first one. Yep. Now, from what you mentioned earlier, you guys started out with skits, and then and then moved moved over into doing um, se series and movies. Um, what yes. what were some what would you say were some of the stumbling blocks from moving between skits and moving between longer form material? I think it was a lot in how they were it was being filmed because with skits, you know, you do you do short takes and then you can edit things together and you only have to worry about feeling like two to three minute time slots mm -hmm. or five minute time blocks. Moving from that going into like 
the production of doing the paranormal show, which mm-hmm. whenever we have it, whenever we pitched it to have it screened, you know, we have to have like 30 minutes filled or 45 minutes filled. So you're constantly going, okay, do we have enough mm-hmm. footage? You know, do we have enough B-roll, you know, to kind of help with the transition scenes? So there was a lot more thought, not that there wasn't thought put into the skits, but there's just a lot more to plan out, I guess you could say, for longer, um, like a TV show, basically. Mm-hmm. And within the within that, when it came to, I'm guessing that there, I'm guessing that um, there were a few there are a few stumbling there are a few uh, things you had to get used to when it came to um, script when it came to doing short scripts versus longer ones. Yes. Yeah, because with longer scripts, I mean, because the, the wrestling show is not scripted. Mm-hmm. Um, or not the wrestling show, the paranormal show is not scripted. So um, we didn't really have to worry about that that much. We just, you know, we wanted to keep with the continuity of whatever story or lore we were going after. But other than that, um, there was no scripting. But going from, you know, a five-minute script to a an hour-and-a-half feature film, there's like a big process in that transition because you have to make sure like character arcs are, mm-hmm. you know, developing properly, that you make it from point A to point B, that the climax is good. There's just like a lot more that goes into that script writing versus, you know, a five minute comedy. Oh uh, yeah, and I've, the the there are there are pro- there are probably entire cemeteries dedicated to dedicated to writers who who wrote in wrote novels or wrote um sequential art and thought that and thought that they could write a um fil- a film or tv script mm-hmm. and end up learning the hard way that it's an apples to oranges kind of situation but given it that really you mentioned is. given that you mentioned lore that brings up something i've i've heard i've heard discussed with some other folk who have worked on te- worked on television and that is the concept of a series bible, which is a concept I wish I came up with, but I can't claim that. Basically, it's th- it's this book or some equivalent, especially in the digital age, that just has all th- all the characters, all the relevant arcs, all the relevant lore, and just where and just where things are sp- where things are supposed to be going to keep everything consistent. Did yeah. you guys have something like that? No, not to start with. Um, in so a lot of the filming and the things done, especially with the first movie, was like, okay, this is our idea for the day. Mm-hmm. Let's go shoot this. It was very unorganized. We're mm-hmm. really proud of that the movie turned out as good as it did. <laughs> so with our second movie, um, um, I came in doing, okay, this is our scene for today. This is what we're doing today. We're, you know, I made sure like the costume continuity was good, like the, the set continuity was good. And I tried to keep a bit more organized. And I never, I didn't hear the, didn't know the term, you know, that Bible or um, mm-hmm. the Bible part of it. But that makes sense because I started from day one to day whenever. Okay, this is how we're keeping things together, and it really does um, help a lot because there's, I mean, whenever you're doing it, you you lose track. Mm-hmm. Um, we it took, um, I it was four months for our last movie, and we were gone like every weekend from Friday to Monday morning, just. Working, mm-hmm. and that all starts bleeding together after a little while, and so that definitely helps having everything kind of organized. This is what we're doing today. This is what we're doing tomorrow, etc. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, and I can de- I can definitely see I can definitely see that, and as 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 much as as much as this line is used and probably and probably overused, I do think the age old adage applies of the first thing you do sucks. Yes, you definitely. And like we look at it as okay, we're at the bottom and we're just moving our way up. Mm-hmm. We're learning from our mistakes. You know, okay, this was the first movie. There was a lot of lighting errors. There was a lot of camera angles that were not correct. It just didn't work. I mean, we made it work in the editing phase, but we could just see that there was just some issues. So from that, we built on that into this next one, and like it was so much better. Mm-hmm. And from this one, we're moving like into the next one. It's you know we're just continuously building those plots because yeah. with our what we're doing is we're doing a six-part chronicle called the Smoky Mountain Chronicle. So we're doing six movies that are anthologies of tributes to local lore in the Smoky Mountain. Mm-hmm. So it's 
it's neat to see how each one just gets better than the one before. Yeah. Now, one of the other major things that I saw on the on the um, YouTube channel was the Big and Funky um, podcast. Um, yeah. What gave you guys the idea to to start to start up the um, to start up the podcast? So Lucy and Vinny had a podcast um, a few years ago, um, strictly with pro wrestling, mm-hmm. and so they're very good. You know, they really enjoyed podcasting, and um, they ended up walking away from it whenever they walked away from it. They stopped doing wrestling. And so we figured that the best way to get people familiar with Big and Funky, um, to bring in people who, you know, other filmmakers or other pro wrestlers or other people that like us, um, mm-hmm. bring them in and get them on the show and interview them. Um, and it was just kind of a way to help us start relating to our fan base. Because mm-hmm. it's, since we're so small that it's not like it's uh, MGM or, you know, something out, Disney putting out something. Everybody knows that's going on. So we've decided we're going to meet every week. We're going to podcast. We're going to shoot shit. We're going to talk about our show. And we're just going to promote it out and, you know, hopefully keep people thinking about us every week. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I'd also, I'd also seen that there's a, while while it's, while it's not one of the bigger things, there seems to be a fair amount of um, old school Atari Atari material. Um, yes. Over the thing. Yes. So Vinny um, is a hundred percent Atari guy. Like he doesn't play anything else. I know nothing about it, but his that is his thing. He <laughs> loves Atari. Uh, now, with the, with that kind with that kind of thing in in mind, um. When it comes to now, I I I manage a hand I manage a handful of shows myself, and sometimes managing a bunch of different gimmicks can get um, overwhelming. How do you guys keep all of that organized? Um, so it helps a lot now that we have more people working um, on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Vinny and Luke tend to head it up, and then they just kind of um, like they filter it down. Like they know my strengths are like PR work. Um, I do a lot of makeup and set design and different stuff like that. So that's the organization part I'm in. Mm-hmm. And they have someone else who manages their podcast, like the actual podcast and does other things. And so um, instead of just, in the very beginning, it was just Vinny and Luke doing mm-hmm. everything. And that was chaotic. And now we have more people on our team, and it kind of disperses that weight. So, you know, it, it makes it easy to keep track of because, you know, you have your – had a bag of tricks, and that's what you're responsible for, and that's what you do. Mm-hmm. And it just keeps the wheel going. Yeah. Now, as I'm, as I'm aware, of the um, the two pro- two projects that you met that you mentioned that I'd like to delve a little bit further in is um, WJHC AM and the Smoky Mountain Chronicles. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd f- first when it comes to WJHC. Um, HC, and just ki- just kind of what it since it's called a comedy horror in the description of it, just what you what sort of style of both you guys are kind of aiming for. So, um, so the, the WJT was Vinny's script, and it's kind of like a back like some of the stuff is real life stories, like stuff that's happened to him, mm-hmm. and. He leans a lot into like Kevin Smith, like Clerks and stuff like that. So that's kind of the humor direction we went with this movie. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's about a DJ that moves from Baltimore in 1999 to work at a radio station. Mm-hmm. And he ends up at a very low end, very low wattage Southern Gospel station. And um, he sees all sorts of crazy happening which was where the big part piece of comedy comes in. And then, um, I don't I don't know how old you are, but you know the, the whole Y2K hype oh, that I, happened I, in 99. Was, I was smack dab in the middle of, of having, to, of, having to, of dealing with people panicking over that. Yes. So, fun fact, I grew up in a cult, okay? Side note. And my parents were majorly into Jesus is coming back, the world is ending, 1999, December 31st, it was it. And so we, my parents, boarded up 
so many beanie weenies and spaghettios waiting for the world to end. Mm -hmm. And obviously nothing happened. And that's what we lived on for the next six months. So uh, <laughs> it was very traumatic. <laughs> but um, so this is basically like the, the gist of the story is what if Jesus did come back on Y2K and all hell breaks loose and people that are left behind have to send it for themselves. And that's where the horror part comes in. So yeah. we have like demons and people dying and a whole bunch of other stuff going on. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why, but when I was going through the description, I ended up being reminded of the late Art Bell. Oh. Um, if you're not familiar with him, he was, he was a, le he was a legend when it came to, um, when it came, when it came to, lo when it came to local, not, not local, but um, specialized radio, especially revol revolving around cert certain, certain, certain conspiracies and. Had a, would do a lot would do a lot of call-ins and kind of kind of became this kind of became this folk hero in that sector. Yeah, I, the name is very familiar because Vinny is very familiar with all those and he's talked about him. So the name is really familiar, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the vibe with the movie. Like there's people calling in whenever all this stuff is going on, and Vinny, the character, mm -hmm. is basically answering the questions like in that 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 way, or like trying to handle the calls and do like do different things. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to um, Smoky Mountain Chronicles, mm -hmm. um, the vi the maybe it's just me, but the vibe that the vibe that I very I get I get out of it is a anthology of folk tales. Yes. In the same. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was I was gonna say in the in the in the vein of how in the vein of how everybody. Um, in my neck of the woods, knows about the story of Paul Bunyan in one form or another, or, so, or um, the sto or in some cases, the story of the Wendigo. Yes, yeah, it's exactly what we're doing. But we're trying to do stuff that people are not overly familiar with, like mm -hmm. the, um, the lore in the Hike was about um, the Spearfinger, who is a charity legend who would draw people out by mimicking people that love and then um, eat their liver. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I never heard of your finger until, you know, this. And I'm like, it is kind of neat to kind of bring the Native American culture out because lead actor is Native American mm -hmm. and was able to kind of tell the story of those, of you know, that people, of the Cherokee people. Mm -hmm. um, and like with Y2K, it's like a, almost like a, a bit of an exposure with like how um hypocritical some Christianity can be and that we you know we can't really judge people by the outside of what's going to happen to them in the long run mm -hmm. and, and it, it's just different things like that we're just pulling bits and pieces of like the, the lore and the, the mythology of our area and just making the way about them you know, make them into visual art mm -hmm. now with that with that with that kind of thing in mind um, I would like to sh I would like to shift a bit into a um an area that an area that's a little bit more familiar with with um with me, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. because as I as hinted at before, I you are you are someone who's who's taking their venture into the weird and wacky world of twenty sided dice. So yeah. as I often ask when it comes to these kind of things. What's your origin story with that, and what made it stick? So, um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I, I grew up in um, a very religious um, cult, um, subsect of, of the Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. um, and I grew up with learning that D&D &D was demonic, that it was these bad things. Like, like we were actually told that the DMs like, somehow cast spells on their players, and if the characters died, then the, then the actual adventurers would die. Like it was like that hyped up. Oh yeah, I'm um, familiar with the weight, with a lot, with a lot of, with a lot of that, including some stuff that was, including some claims that were even wilder, which I'll get to in a minute. <laughs> I'm excited to hear that because we uh, we may have the same same story, um, but from there, like I, I kind of started deconstructing from the cult in my twenties. Mm -hmm. So it um, in my twenties, um, I had a friend who he actually lives in Australia, and he would talk to me about how he played D and D, and I'm like, 
this guy is like really cool. He doesn't seem like a Satan worshiper, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like in a cult mindset, like mm-hmm. he's not evil. So he's having fun with D&D. I just don't, you know, they get it. So in this, the last, this past year, we've been friends, he and I have been friends for like 15 years. Mm-hmm. I finally was like, okay, so tell me about D&D. Like, what is it really about? And he's like, well, you know, he gave me the premise of it. And I was like, oh, I think I want to give it a try. And he's like, are you sure? And I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm like, I'll give it a try. So he sent me my first set of dice, which I was really excited about. And um, he created a one shot for me to um, kind of get my feet wet because it can be very overwhelming when we first get into it. And um, my first character was a dragonborn warlock with this crazy, like this fun little backstory. Mm-hmm. And um, as I played, I realized like this is literally acting. It's mm-hmm. improvisation. And it's, there's so much creativity that goes into making characters and building the story, whether it's homebrew or, for, you know, from one of the handbooks. Mm-hmm. And it's, there's so much that, there's so much, that you can do with it mm-hmm. and me being a, a, an actress and a writer and into movies this just and like and i've done i have a theater background as well it just fit right into who i am as a poor person as a poor person this is my creative outlet mm-hmm. so in, instead of my day job which is doing the movie stuff and the pr stuff this is my this is mine like mm-hmm. i have my characters i have my stories that we can do in my my group of friends and this is just that's what made it stick it became um a creative part of myself that i'm Mm -hmm. like okay this is something fun yeah and um when it given that given that and given that given that origin i i it'd be rational of me to assume fifth edition was the was the entry point um yes and while i while I, while I have my issues with, with with that with that edition, that is beyond the scope of this. Um, but the but the race class combination of dragonborn and warlock is something that is something that I find very interesting because that's not a combination I see often. And I've been around the block when it comes to this kind of thing. Usually, <laughs> usually, if I'm being honest, mo- the most the most popular Babby's first. Um, character I see the mo- I see most often is human fighter, or in some or in some either human fighter, elven mage, or ha- or halfling rogue tend to be ones I see a lot because they're easy archetypes for people t- for people to um, consider. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe tiefling warlock for the edge lords out there, but dragonborn warlock is not one that I see often. So I'm curious, <laughs> what led you down to that particular pick? So I, so whenever I got the handbook, I was like reading through the races and the classes and I really liked the nobility and like the honor that kind of went through the race of the dragonborn. Mm -hmm. But I was like, what if, and I'm like, I wanted them, I wanted my character to have magical ability, but I'm like, I don't want to do a sorcerer. I want to do something different. So I was talking with my friend who was helping me get into it. I was like, what if my dragonborn sold herself? to like Baphomet to save her people mm-hmm. and like so she sold herself to this dark entity to become this warlock to be able to save her tribe and because of that she's in exile mm-hmm. and um he's like that's really cool because he's been do- he's been doing D&D since like high school he's mm-hmm. like that sounds really interesting that sounds fun let's let's go with it and that's that was the start of Niobe that was my first character I was like this, this is fun this is Almost like a a, a a sacrifice one for the good of many type yeah. of mentality. So, given given that, I think I don't think it, I can I don't think it would be off for me to say that you used um you ended up going with Infernal Warlock. Um. Yes, I did. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Good guess. I'm not. Sh- I'm not yeah. sure if it. I'm not sure if it was a. If it was a guess or if I'm. Ch- or if I'm channeling, my. In- I'm channeling my inner Sherlock Holmes, but either <laughs> or. Oh. Right. But um, that's. Well, it was. It was fun. So, so he. He went through the. Um, the one shot that mm-hmm. Niobe did, and then into, uh, just like a short campaign to kind of get me into it, and then, 
um, I started with, I got my husband into it, and my second D&D character was a dwarf sorcerer who basically has powers like Storm from X-Men. Mm-hmm. And that was fun. That's been, I've been playing her for a while, and she's, she's very fun. Now uh, you, you meant, wait, wait a minute. Let me see. Let me see if I get this. The first one you said I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be just another sorcerer. And then for your next one, you end up picking sorcerer anyways. I did because <laughs> her origin story is she was. She just was. She was not born into born of dwarven, like from a dwarf woman. Mm-hmm. She just they just found her in the woods. So she has like an unknown, like holy origin where she has like these uncanny sorcerer powers. And mm-hmm. There's just. Um, and it was almost like her trek into trying to figure out who she is because she, she has, you know, white hair and she has eyes, blue eyes, and she doesn't quite, you know, her, uh, growing up, she didn't quite fit in with, you know, the normal dwarf, mm-hmm. the hill dwarf. And so she's on this adventure to try to figure out who she is. And my, the DM that I'm playing with is really weave that into the story. Mm-hmm. So. So I'm getting clues as we're going through the campaign that she's starting to find out, oh, okay, maybe this, this is it, this is it, you know, kind of thing. It's kind of fun. Yeah, so I'm, ge- I'm guessing I'm ge- I'm guessing that the sorceress origin you went with is divine? Yes. Jeez, I am, re- I am, getting, I am way too good at this. <laughs> <laughs> You've been doing it for a while. See, like, I'm still such a novice, but I to have be too much fun To be it. fair... You picked two of the two casting classes that you the two casting classes that you picked are two of, mm-hmm. are two of the better ones and two of the ones that get get more use than uh, than others. Um, mm-hmm. The the one that the one that's the most unfortunate is the wizard. Okay. At least in, at least in my opinion, largely because of the fact that while thing while things like sorcerers and war, and warlocks. And later on, artificers would have their have casting and their own gimmick. Mm-hmm. The wizards' problem is that they just have more casting, which also means they have to deal with a a um, rule that has been a annoyance at my table and one that I've tried to house rule around as best I can, and that is concentration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I ran into that too, and it's so frustrating. And I think that may have been like in the back of my mind when I created my second character and I went with Sorcerer. I was like, I don't want to deal with all the concentration. Mm-hmm. It's so frustrating. Oh yeah, it's cer- it certainly is. Although although um, there are there are wa- there are ways or there are ways around the issue. Um, mm-hmm. the the stuff that sort the the evocations that warlocks can do and the um, meta magics that sorcerers can do are so, are some workarounds, but the bi- the big issues that for a lot of a lot of people have joked that um in that concentration makes it almost a necessity for a source for a caster to get haste as soon as they get the chance. Mm-hmm. But it could be far worse. You could have started as a ranger. <laughs> I could have. Which is really funny because my husband did, and he's like, he's like, why do you get all this bullshit? And I was like, because you chose to be a ranger, so <laughs> that's on you. <laughs> to be fair, the ranger has the ranger has been as as been, has had the third wheel problem for a long time, and actually in the early days it was even worse. <laughs> oh really? Well, the the problem the problem was is that. The problem was first off it could it the fact that it couldn't equip heavy armor when armor class was a, when armor class made had a much bigger deal when it came to when it came to how when it came to how much damage you'd be taking mm-hmm. and 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 the fact that back then characters were a lot more squishy some people long for the squishier days I'm neutral on that particular debate large largely because mm-hmm. the last thing I the last thing I want is for some is for someone to get in, someone to get wiped just because they man they managed a slightly bad roll that day. Exactly. Yeah. I um, there's a there's a reason why the Nick that why um Tomb of Horrors one of the more infamous modules over the years has gotten the nickname at my table of bullshit. Because <laughs> the 
because that's basically what it is. It is it is it is a it is a it is an escalating series of saw level save or die traps. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awful. <laughs> yeah. But when when I came I did promise that I was that I was going to I was going to share with you a more a infamous story when it came to yes. when it came to some of the claims because when I was in high school, because of the fact that I had to deal with people making these ridiculous claims, I decided to do a deep dive into how many ridiculous claims I could find so I could understand how to counter them. You know, the whole thing mm-hmm. of know your enemy. Absolutely. And there were, a f- there were a few ones that were absolutely ridiculous. One of them was the claim that, um, D- that, D&D ven- that D&D venerated Hitler which was taken out of context from a discussion on charisma in an early copy of I believe it was the Dungeon Master's Guide where they were going where it was going over the fact that charisma does not necessarily equate to physical attractiveness. Right. And it used Hitler and Napoleon as examples of people who were charismatic but not necessarily model looker. Exactly. Oh. Um, and to me that's a fair assessment. Mhm. Um uh, I think, but that's just the appetizer. I want, I wanted to get, I wanted to put in something slightly, slightly ridiculous before I get to the, before I get to the real dumb things. Big deal. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the bigger ones was the was the claim that that they ha- that they had contacted a real world occultist to make sure quote the rituals were authentic, which yep. already sounds ridiculous, and it. And if you think if you think that sounds really dumb, congratulations! You're smarter than the people who made this claim. Yes, oh. I heard I heard that too. Growing, like we literally thought like it was like handed down from an occult leader, and oh my gosh, it was a lot. But so here, but here was, and hey, first for. Give give me one moment, cause I cause I because in order for me to do this, I need to get the I need to get the notes that I wrote back in two thousand seven. Okay. Um, because I because I did a full re- I did a full report on this on this kind of thing. Um, so let me see where. Let me. Let me don't mind don't mind me just scro- just scrolling because this was this was an eighteen page document. Ah, found it. <laughs> so, this was this claim. I did the re- the claim was made by a Satanist turned Christian, supposedly, named okay. William Sch- Schnobelin. If I'm pre- if I'm mispronouncing his name, I don't care, <laughs> and you're about to see why. He claims to have lived in Lake Geneva during the 70s. I could not corroborate this, and he claims that he was contacted by employees of TSR, the original owners of D and D. Long story. And in his in his um in his article called Straight Talk on Dungeons and Dragons, he had claimed and I I wanted I had to make sure to dig this up just so I just so I can go through this word for word so you can see the ridiculousness. Quote I was a witch high priest of Alexandrian tradition during the period of nineteen seventy three to nineteen eighty four. During some of that period I was also in, I was also involved in hardcore Satanism. We studied and practiced and trained more than 175 people in the craft. Our covendom was in Milwaukee, just a short drive away from the world headquarters of TSR. In the late 1970s, a couple of game writers actually came to my wife and I as prominent sorcerers in the community. They wanted to make certain the rituals were authentic. For the most part, they are. These two guys sat in our living room and took copious notes. From from us on how to, on how to make sure the rituals were right from the book, they seem satisfied with what they left, with what they got and left. Here's one here's one small problem. He claims that this he claims that this was done in the period between 1976 and 1980. Mm-hmm. By that point in time, D and D would have been out for about two years. Oh, and, that's a problem. Now. The ad- now advanced D and D came out in 1979, but there's nothing but there's nothing in AD and D that would necessitate having to look up rituals. <laughs> right. It was just it was just taking the basic rules of the fir- of the first one, and just expanding it. Right. Um, 
and of course the phenomenal. Yeah, of course the names of the the names of the testers are never given, so I can't even be sure if they if they were actual representatives, unlike unlikely, or just or just people trying to pull a fast one, or they were just right. completely made up. <laughs> um, he also I, claimed I, I in one. The latter. <laughs> he also claimed just to make just to hammer home how ridiculous this guy was and how he may have been a few, um. A few, a few, a few eggs short of a picnic. <laughs> that the Necronom, that the Necronomicon and the Cthulhu mythos are real, and he claimed to be a ex a ex vampire who <laughs> who who <laughs> built a special trapezoidal vampire coffin to attract vampiric demo dark demonic energy, which he hoped to achieve demonic resurrection. That that is a direct quote. Oh my gosh, he was a, he's a quack. Yeah, the, I am honestly shocked that this guy was not in the not in the National Quack Museum when that was at when that was at the U of M when I was a kid. <laughs> oh my gosh, and here's the thing: like, like a lot of that was in the height of the the the, the, the satanic panic that was like in, and like we like I remember like even Pokemon being demonic. Yeah. And then, from Pokemon being demonic, then we went into Harry Potter being demonic, and um, like we had someone who came through and preached at our church, who was supposedly a former Satanist, and he said I was unpacking the box of the books of um, Harry Potter, and I looked inside the first page, and it was quote straight out of the book of Satan. <laughs> and anyone who's ever picked up Harry Potter knows that there is nothing from the book of Satan <laughs> in Harry Potter. The the most the most that you get is is some very is some very bad butchering of Latin. Yes, and you can go to I mean you can go to a Catholic church and hear that. So it's not the 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 um the satanic book fault. It's just it just kills me. I swear. And one as far as far as why I what the other reason that I that I keep digging into these kind of things is because well at. As Napoleon supposedly said, never interrupt your enemy when he ma when he's making a mistake. And second off, I look at these things and I just bust out laughing. <laughs> yes. Especially, yep. especially get especially given, um, the fact that I'm not sure if you had to, but I had to sit through that Mazes and Monsters m movie a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, I did. <laughs> The one with the one with a DVD cover that's full of lies. Yes. And we even had the, the I don't know if you know what the, what is it, but it's Click Track, which is basically a. Comic oh yes, book. I am. I am very familiar with the Chick Tracks. <laughs> yes, and so we had those that were like okay D and D, like and it's like like people killing them. I mean, it looks like really graphic, and we give these to kids, and I'm like, what are you doing? I so, you still. You'd, I still find when I was working retail, I'd still find I still find those chick tracks in the trash. Honestly, <laughs> their natural habitat, but the fact that I was still finding them in the trash or or on, or on the or lying or, or lying around on the sidewalk when somebody threw them out, I don't need, I never even saw anybody handing them out. No, because I'll I'll tell you the trick was is like we were told to slide them like into the cases of alcohol so people when they got home and opened up their beer there would be. A, tra a trash there, or we we were taught different places to hide them, mm -hmm. so then people would just happen upon them. It was, it's a whole thing. Like that's a whole different podcast I could go into. <laughs> but let me tell you, it's uh, crazy. I do remember some. I do remember um somebody distrib somebody scanning the dark dungeons one, and writing a script as if the cast of Mystery Science Theater, they. A staple of it, a staple of any Minnesota geek, um, as if the as if they were riffing it. And yeah. I wish I still had, I wish I still had that script, but it's unfortunately been lost to time. And, and mystery science theater is my jam, so mm -hmm. that would, that's fantastic. Yeah, but with that with that in with that in mind, when it came to when it came to when it came to trying to set trying to set up a trying trying to um 
get trying to get other people involved with the with the hobby. Were there were there? Any, I'm curious about what the what the sales pitch was from your, from oh. your end when you were trying to get your husband into it. Um. Well, I, so he actually was like hanging out downstairs when I played my one shot, and he was listening to me. And after it was done, he walked in the room. He was like, "That sounded really cool." I was like, "It was." And that was literally my, I'm like the lamest sales pitch ever. I'm like, it was cool. <laughs> and so he's like, I, I think I kind of want to get into it. So I started basically explaining it. Mm-hmm. And, and then he created his first character. We, we found a group on like a D and D Facebook group that are searching for players. And so we, mm-hmm. we were able to find a bunch of other people who were just looking for a couple more players. And um, they were already established in D and D. So um, it kind of helped Sam, my husband, get into it a little bit easier because I was still pretty unfamiliar mm-hmm. um, getting, whenever I was getting him into it. So um, we played with our, our group on Discord, and um, it's been fantastic. So. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm pretty sh- I can only imagine the f- I can only imagine the look that you had when you got when you ended up getting your first nat one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, oh my word! I was just like, "What the hell is this?" Welcome. One of the many mantras we have here in my temple is, "The dice gods show no mercy," and RN no. Jesus does not save. <laughs> no. It's. Thanks. I remember. I remember when I. I remember when we when we found a um we found a dice catapult on Etsy, and one of my colleagues asked, "Why would you make that?" And I'm like. To expunge cursed dice, why else would you make it? Absolutely. Yeah, we have a shame box. Like I, we have a little box. We will put our dice in, and we will do a shame, like say shame, like from Game of Thrones, whenever Cersei's going down the street, <laughs> and like we shame our dice, or at least we try to. <laughs> um, a while back, on, a while back on Facebook, I was seeing a bunch of people. Um, do you, rem- do you remember when? Do you remember when the dog shaming calendar was was a bit of a thing? Yes. With do- dogs with sad faces and what and with a yeah. um, card of what they did wrong, somebody did that yeah. with dice. They put <laughs> they put up a bunch of di- they put up a bunch of dice and that and and what and what it di- and what it did what it did wrong. That is fantastic. I'll have to see if I can find that on the internet. Uh, I think, that's wonderful. I think if you just look up dice shaming on just on Google Image Search, you should be able to find it. Yeah. Oh. Um. I'll have to do that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I well, I what kills me is like the, the fact that you can roll fantastic whenever it doesn't matter. Like you can get your nat twenty whenever you're trying to jump over a pond, right? Mm-hmm. But whenever you're in the middle of fighting the big boss, you're sitting there rolling like a two, or <laughs> or a five, and you're like, oh, for real? I, I don't want to die today. I think my fa- I think my favorite cases of the of that kind of thing is when the DC is something that something that somebody cannot physically roll that high, and they still want to mm-hmm. do it anyways because they go, "Hey, I got a five I got a five percent chance to crit," and and I'm just sitting there going, "Okay, but if th- but if this ends up backfiring on you, you've got nobody to blame for you but yourself." <laughs> yes. <laughs> and ev- and I. And in those kind of situations, I end up looking at I end up looking at the rest of the table, and they're and they're like, "I'm not I'm not involved with any of this." <laughs> and, he, and he or she rolls, and it's a one. Oh my gosh! Yes. Yeah. So here's here's the thing that's, it, that fascinates me is the, the, the creativity in in the skill for a DM to jump around and follow whatever their adventure is in getting into. That fascinates me. So I think eventually I'm going to end up DMing my own campaign because there's, um, because you just never know. Like I think that's what's exciting about it. You don't know what people are going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it's me asking you. I mean, do you, what is your favorite part about DMing um, for D and D? If I'm be if I'm be if I'm being honest, it 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 there now. Do you do you want the do you want the do you want the answer? Or do you want the smart ass answer? <laughs> I, I per- the smart ass answer would be fantastic. Um, 
I love the fact that I'm able to live rent-free in my players' heads without doing anything. There are times where I will roll dice behind the table just to watch their reaction. <laughs> it's just cause. there are some there are some D, every D, every D, no matter how much they want to admit otherwise every DM has a shoulder devil that is con that is constantly tempting them with new and interesting ways to screw with the players. <laughs> a lot of people will claim that that does, that that is not real. Those people are wrong and should probably be pistol whipped. They should not be DMing, right? <laughs> no, it, I'm, if they want to DM, fine, but don't lie to me, is what I'm saying. Right, right. But truth be told, there, truth be told, there's a lot of fa there's a lot of factors that I enjo that I enjoy when it comes to being a DM. Um, the only downside is that I end up being too good at it, so I end up being a forever DM. But mm -hmm. it is it is the fact that it is the construction of of the of the adventure the construct the construction of multiple adventures since i write i have a i have a bit of, everybody has their own gming style um mm -hmm. i tr because of the vast variety of games that i run i treat running a running a session and running a campaign as if i'm stru as if i'm structuring episodes of a television show mm -hmm. um that's not to say I write a I write a full on script. If somebody were to um, read my notes, first off, good luck because I have doctor's handwriting. <laughs> but my but my style tent my style tends to be have far more in common with the with say with say the format of a wrestling show. No, not mm -hmm. much in the way of scripting, but a lot of bullet points of what needs to be hammered home at in what order. Right. Um. So it's basically like your guide, like you need to make it from this point to this point to this point. And you yeah. Just, is that how you just kind of keep them on track? It is how it is how I keep th it is how I keep things on track. Um, rel working around an act system certainly helps. Um, when I'd run Elf, when I'd run Legend of the Five Rings, one of my other favorites, um, it has a it has a three act set setup called setup, focus, and strike, that I can kind of build a framework around. Um. Nice. But one of the one of the key things, and this is something that I always tell people starting out, there do not underestimate the importance of two things. One, session zero. Before before mm -hmm. any before any real play in the adventure gets started, a session zero to go to go through character creation and get and help people get kind of a feel for the character that they're going to be doing before the, before they get their feet wet. Mm -hmm. The other thing is putting in some type of primer. Is well, a lot a lot of people have the idea that you're on, that you're only going to be doing um, dungeon crawls, and while mm -hmm. that's certainly that's certainly one angle, that's not the angle. You have the dungeon crawls. You have more freeform hex crawls where I don't where I don't do the axe structure because that would be pointless. Mm -hmm. You have you have one you have ones that are go that are going to structure themselves more like a television episode, es especially depending on the game. And even within that, there are different styles. If someone mm -hmm. was running Legend of the Five Rings like they'd run Dungeons and Dragons, they'd run into problems because that's not the kind of game that it's meant to be. Mm -hmm. um, Legend of the Five Rings has far more in common with Game of Thrones in the sense that it's more about. Um, political drama than it is a, than it is about hacking and slashing, right? And that's some that's something that you have to be aware of, and that's something that you have to make sure your players are aware of of what style of game is being run. Um, not too long ago, I was running a a Italian game that's been translated into English, Lex Arcana. Which mm -hmm. could be which could be described as a um, alternate history Rome, where where not only did the empire not fall, but it actually managed to sustain itself for another hundred years. Oh, cool! To the point where it established colonies in Britain and Egypt. Mm -hmm. And because of the fact that the player characters are meant to be part of an org organization called the Cohors Auxiliaris Arcana. That are that are tasked with investigating and dealing with supernatural threats. 
when I wrote the primer for that adventure, I, t I made it explicitly clear, this is going to be an investigative campaign. This is going to be, this is going to have more in common with the X-Files or Fringe or, or Section mm -hmm. 13. Yeah. No, 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 sorry, Warehouse 13. Than it is with, than it is with Gladiator or, or Spartacus. Right. Combat is not combat is not going to be that heavy of a thing, and when it is, it's get it's going to be against monsters that are that you can't use human tactics against. Nice. And of course, and what and once I had established that, then it's up to the players to work to work around those boundaries. Mm hmm It's is I know some people will say that you should get that you should give um, players total total freedom. There is such a thing as giving people too much freedom. Right. When you do that, you end up with um, a bit of choice paralysis. Honestly, and I'm I'm pretty sure you I'm pretty sure you had a few cases of that when when it came to character creation or even advancement in some cases. Yeah. Of just have just having so many options and not wanting the not wanting a bad choice to bite you on the ass down the road. Yes. Oh, I think that I think that's the reason why. If you if you do a bit of digging, you'll find entire threads on forums dedicated to character optimization. I know because I've participated in some of those kind of things. Even though some of them tend to be, tend to be about, okay, how 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 easily can we can we make a character that's going to break everything? Right. <laughs> that's how a few years ago we got pun pun. Oh. I haven't heard that one. Um, it started. It was in, it was on the old Wizards forums. It started out as someone trying to make an a experiment to make a kobold the most broken character possible, and because of a loophole that it exploited with with a certain class combination, it can potentially have infinite levels. Really. In infinite classes. Nobody's been able. I haven't seen anybody try and convert Pon Pon onto fifth edition. This was during the third edition days, uh -huh. but there is there is the fact that a that someone who's playing cleric or warlock who knows what they're doing can be an entire party all to themselves. We, um, my partner and I call it ca call it Cowzilla, mm. cleric or warlock. Yeah. Um. But. With, within that, within that, you, since you mentioned you mentioned wanting to wanting to uh, DM your DM yourself, I'm guessing that a lot of your a lot of your experience has been through, um, virtual tabletop. Yes, it has. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, I would love to get into like actually into like a in person playing, but with COVID, it's kind of like messed a lot of that stuff up. Mm -hmm. It seems like. Well, that and ha that and having to deal with um, time management. Yeah. And and the issue of who's br of who's bringing the snacks. Yes, absolutely. Pro tip. Snacks are important. Pro tip: anybody who brings Cheetos gets the stink eye. <laughs> you don't like Cheetos. You know, I was about to say Cheetos. You don't like Cheetos. I don't like. I don't like having. Ch I don't like having cheese dust all over people's books. That's fair. But what if you have like someone brings like moist pellets and you can wipe your fingers off? It's still on the books, and I don't want to get pages wet. <laughs> the bringing okay. in Cheetos is the kind of is the kind of thing that that guy does. That guy. Yeah. Noted. Yeah. I will, I'll do my best never to be that guy. Well, that that's the that's the that's the meme. There's. Yeah. There, um. One of the one of the forums that I follow took took the old memes of good guy Greg and scumbag Steve and reformed it into this guy and that guy, i.e. everything everything that you sh everything right with when it comes to players or DMs and everything you shouldn't do as either. Nice. Um, usually usually with a short list that end that ends with you know what fuck that guy be like this guy. <laughs> but so um whenever i was first introduced to dnd I, I was told that there is also this the rule of cool that if it sounds cool and it's going to be cool then it's 
you know, it's it's good to go. Even yes. If it doesn't necessarily fit. The rule of the 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 rule of cool is is something that I is something that I adhere to, and I I have a couple corollaries to it. Because mm-hmm. as much as I like it, I th- I don't think it I don't think it fully encompasses the matter when it comes to, um the when it comes to role playing. Mm-hmm. Um, more prev more prevalent is something of a side thing when it comes to the rule of cool is and this is something that's important especially for DMs, is what's known as rule zero. Okay. Um. A lot of ge- a lot of games have a rule zero entry in some form or another, and the the way it's written tends to vary depending on who's writing. But it boils down to this. If the rules are here, the rules are here to facilitate fun. If a rule is getting away is getting in the way of fun, get rid of it. Yeah. Like Gygax house ruled his own game. Do not I always tell people do not be <laughs> afraid to to bend or break the or break the core rules if you so need. Right. Oh. Nice. That's been the DMs that I've played under. They've been like, okay, as long as it makes sense, you know, break the rule or do this. I mean, it, they're pretty. They've been pretty cool about it. Yeah. The uh, the other thing is that I, as one of my mantras, I have I have the mindset of believability over realism. Mm-hmm. This idea that as long as it's pre- as long as something ridiculous is presented in a in a way that I can go along with it because of some internal logic, I'm perfectly fine with that. Mm-hmm. It's when it's when you break the internal lot internal logic that there's problems. You know you've yeah. you've, you've probably seen a bad movie where they where it introduces rules in the script and then br- and then breaks them because it's convenient. Yes, yeah. it's so annoying. It's, it certainly is, and it's it's one of those it's one of those things that can very quick very quickly tank a movie for me. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And, and what's funny is like now being on this side of making movies, I'm I'm actually more critical about mm-hmm. certain things because I know what it's like on the other like behind the the camera, and I'm like, mm-hmm. we had way less money than you did. Mm-hmm. And and we made this work out. Well, I don't understand. But on on the flip side, I can also appreciate really good execution or really good, you know, really well done stories because I'm like, okay, that took a lot of work to make it look like this, mm-hmm. you know. And yeah, there's de- there is definitely that, and I'm, and I'm pretty sure you I'm pretty sure you, you can you've um, been able to spot some. Some goofs that that lay people might uh, might have overlooked. Um, yeah, I would give one bit of advice when it comes to DMing. Um, mm-hmm. Don't be a novelist. Don't be or a script writer. My mentor would always tell me a script writer is shorthand for a bad GM. That's good to know. <laughs> and that is good. To- truth and truth be told. Um, Encour- encouraging Im- encouraging improv is 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 par- is paramount, mm-hmm. as well as as well as as well as exploring the consequences. So if some if somebody does something stupid, you can still have them roll for you can still have them roll for it after telling them, "Are you sure?" But whatever happens after that happens. <laughs> yeah, karma with your character. <laughs> if you do something stupid, something stupid is going to come back. Yeah. The the example that I, the example that I always I always go to and I've and ever since I have refused to let this person um, live this down is the is the is the fact that um with because we're because we're running a bit of a um a bit of a Magitech focused campaign I wanted everybody to come up with some cre- some come up with some ridiculous weapon um mm-hmm. he came up with a shield gun. Gun that ha- gun that has a gun that's a att- gun that's attached to a tower shield, so he's basically a mul- he's basically a turret that can be picked up and replaced wherever he needs it. Nice. For whatever reason, during one of the bigger encounters, he decides to throw the thing like it's ca- like he's Captain America. Oh my! God. And 
<laughs> I en I ended up he ended up rec he ended up recalling the thing back using one of his spells. But the point is, he did this like three times, and the whole t the whole time I was having this slow boiling WTF energy because I'm like. <laughs> You asked me to put it. You asked me to put a gun on your shield, and you just think you and you just throw the thing. That makes no sense. And I had told I had told him I had made it very clear to him af afterwards. I am never letting you live this down, and I'm going to be getting on you for this for as long as I live. That was almost That's seven years ago. <laughs> That was around seven years ago, and I have and I have held true to my word. I have never let him live that down. That's fantastic. Because as as I made clear to as I made clear er, earlier before we went on, I am a petty Betty. <laughs> You're well, petty Betty. There's got to there's got to be a, there's got to be a male version. What would be a male equivalent to Betty? So because because um well I'm too I'm too much of a guy to use Betty. Let's think here. Hmm. I'll have to brainstorm on that one. Yeah, the problem is I you'd need one that begins with B and ends with w ends with a Y or something that rhymes with a y, with a Y. I need Teddy Benny. That works. Benny? <laughs> Teddy Benny. I'm just besides when I hear when I hear Betty, I keep thinking of Black Betty. I don't know why. <laughs> I think of Betty Boots. So. <laughs> well, in that case, I I think I may have one out on that one. Yeah, I think you probably Jerry. did. <laughs> Jerry's out. Jerry's out of that. <laughs> we'll reconvene in the morning, right? Um, I'll let I'll I'll um. You know, it's times like these, I think I think more debates need to be settled with cane fights, like they were three hundred years ago. <laughs> you know, I think there would be a lot less crime in many things if we just settled things with cane. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Bring back. Bring back dueling. Yeah, you insulted me. You, you know, you looked at me funny. Let's go shoot each other the next day. Well, it, it's logical sense. Well, it works. For, it works fair enough, and it works fair enough in hockey. You got two people who've who who have gotten pissed off at each other. Drop the gloves. Come, go out, yep. go out, swing, and then be and then be put in a box for two minutes. Yep, that is true. I I actually enjoy hockey. I'm like minor leagues. That's what I what I follow. I um, we have a team here in Knoxville. Yeah. I follow I follow a mix of my, of minor and major leagues as well as whatever whatever I can take a look at games over in Russia through the uh, KHL. Mm -hmm. Um, not as not as often that not as often as I'd like, but sometimes it, sometimes seeing a, a whole different hockey culture is interesting in that regard. Are they more aggressive? Um, there's not a, not so much. It's far it's far more of a speedy boy kind of thing. Mm, okay. Like the more the more aggre the more aggressive players are the are the ones that te that um tend to come out of, tend to come out of North America, mm. and especially some especially some parts of Canada where old blood where old blood still runs. Yeah. Though the the whole the whole goon thing really ha really has kind of d has kind of been dialed back over the years. I think yeah. I th it's it's something you don't it's something you didn't see as much after the after what's known as the Good Friday Massacre of the eighties. Mm. Because well, you got two you got two Canadian teams in the same district who've hated each other for years. Right. Figure out what's going to happen after that. <laughs> Nothing good. No. But with all that said, I. Do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and putting up with all all the rambliness and insanity that happens here in the temple. Thank you for having me on. I've enjoyed myself. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I say around here often, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and, and I'll tip one to you for that. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, 
stay fucking frosty, everybody.